Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we gather once again to study your holy word, the sure word of prophecy for these last days. And Father, we ask that as we open that word, that the Holy Spirit will be with us to guide our thoughts. Our ways are not your ways, and your ways are not our ways. That's the reason why, in order to understand you, we need special revelation. And so we ask for your presence, and we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Holy Spirit had fallen on the day of Pentecost, and the Christian movement was growing and extending like a grass fire. In fact, in Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, we find a description of the fact that many members and priests were leaving Judaism and they were joining the Christian movement. It says there, Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. In other words, clergy and laity were being converted to Christianity. The Bible tells us that one of the reasons for this phenomenal growth was the work of Stephen, who was one of the seven deacons. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 8, we're told that Stephen was instrumental in the growth of the church. It says there, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. So fast was the Christian movement growing that Judaism was greatly disturbed. In fact, there was one particular person who was very disturbed. It was a young man who was a very promising prospect for Judaism. It appeared like he had a brilliant future. He was young, energetic, and relentless. His name was Saul of Tarsus. Now Saul had tunnel vision. He believed that God had chosen the Jewish nation unconditionally and irrevocably and woe to whoever questioned that fact. You see, for Saul of Tarsus, the preservation of Judaism was number one on his list. Judaism had to be preserved at all costs. We're told in Acts chapter 22 and verse 3, and here the Apostle Paul is talking about his heritage. He says, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, great teacher, by the way, taught according to the strictness of our Father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. And so here we find Saul of Tarsus describing his Jewish heritage. Now Saul wanted to preserve the, Christ, the, the Judaism for the same reason that the Jews that led Jesus to the cross wanted to preserve Judaism. In fact, in John chapter 11, in verses 47 through 50, we find uh, the high priest Caiaphas speaking before the Sanhedrin and he was explaining why they needed to do away with Christ. There was a special reason. It had to do with national security. In other words, the subsistence of the Jewish nation was at stake. We find there in John 11, 47 through 50, this is happening just a few months before the death of Christ. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. What was the, the worry of the Sanhedrin? That this would grow so great that, it, that Judaism would disappear. Notice verse 49. It says, And one of them, Caiaphas, 
being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. So notice that the main argument for destroying Christ was the preservation of the Jewish nation. The same feeling was in the heart of Saul of Tarsus. He said this growing Christian movement is a menace to Judaism and it must be destroyed. In Acts chapter 26 and verses 9 through 11, we find a description of Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church. It says there in Acts 26 verses 9 through 11, Paul is reminiscing about his previous life. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So Saul of Tarsus had the same spirit as the Sanhedrin. In his mind, the preservation of Judaism was uppermost in his mind. And this is the reason why Saul of Tarsus was so intent on destroying not only Christianity, but particularly Stephen, who was one of those who was leading to the phenomenal growth of Christianity. In fact, we find in Acts chapter 7 and verses 57 and 58 that when Stephen was being stoned, Saul of Tarsus was present there. It says, Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. But not only was Saul present for the stoning of Stephen, the Bible gives us the impression that Saul of Tarsus was the ringleader and the mastermind behind the death of Stephen. We're told in Acts chapter 22 and verse 20, And when the blood of your martyr, this is Saul speaking, or Paul at this point, And when the blood of your martyr, Stephen, was shed, I also was standing by, consenting to his death, and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. So we find Saul of Tarsus actively involved and planning the death of Stephen because he was one of the instruments in the growth of the Christian movement. Now we find that after the stoning of Stephen, Saul of Tarsus decided to go on an expedition to hunt down Christians in the city of Damascus. In fact, he would have had to travel a long ways because Jerusalem is a very long way from Damascus. You have to cross all of Israel to the northern border. You have to go across Lebanon and into Syria. We find a description of this persecution in Acts 9 and verses 1 and 2. We're told there, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder, against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogue of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, that's the name of the Christian movement, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And so Saul of Tarsus was on the way to Damascus to arrest Christians and to take them to Jerusalem to stand trial, and most likely to be killed. But it was on the road to Damascus that Saul of Tarsus had an experience that not only changed his life, but also changed his theology. On the road to Damascus, he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. He discovered that by persecuting the church, he was actually persecuting Jesus because he heard a voice that, from heaven that said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he says, 
Who are you so that I know who I'm persecuting? And Jesus says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. In other words, by persecuting my body, you are persecuting me. Let's read about this in Acts chapter 9 and verses 3 through 6. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. That means that he was kicking against his conscience. Verse 6, So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? The Bible says that he was sent to a man called Ananias. And Ananias met Saul of Tarsus in the house of an individual called Judas. And I want you to notice how the story is picked up in Acts 22, verses 16 through 18. Here Luke is telling the story of this experience on the road to Damascus. It says here, but the Lord said to him, that is to Ananias, go, and the context indicates he was supposed to go to the house of Judas. But the Lord said to him, go, for he, that is Saul of Tarsus, is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Now listen, he not only received his physical eyesight, the scales that fell from his eyes were the scales of prejudice. He now saw that God's people were those who received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Now in Galatians chapter 3 and verses 26 and 27, we find a very important concept. It says there, all those who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now we know that Saul of Tarsus was baptized. So whom did Saul of Tarsus put on? He put on Jesus Christ. Now there's another important context, concept. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 15 and verse 16, we find that the Apostle Paul says that the promises were made to Abraham and to his seed. And there the, uh, the Apostle Paul, who's writing later on after his conversion, says that the text does not say to seeds as to many, but to your seed who is Christ. In other words, the seed of Abraham is one solitary person, and that solitary person is whom? Jesus Christ. Jesus is the seed of Abraham. But now I want you to notice that those who are in Christ through baptism, like Saul of Tarsus, now become Abraham's seed through Jesus. Notice Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29. It says, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What does it mean to be Abraham's seed? Does it mean to have Jewish blood in your veins? No. Does it mean that you live in Israel? No. Does it mean that your last name is Goldberg? Absolutely not. It says here that those who are in Christ are what? Are Abraham's seed. If you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed. Which means that if you are not Christ's, you are not Abraham's seed. That's a very, very important concept that we're going to pursue. So when Saul of Tarsus was baptized, he was baptized into Christ. He was incorporated into Christ. And through Christ, he became Abraham's seed. He was not Abraham's seed before joining Jesus Christ. Now this experience on the road to Damascus totally changed the focus of Saul of Tarsus. Notice Acts chapter 9 and verse 22. Acts chapter 9 and verse 22. 
Here it says, but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is what? The Christ. What does the word Christ mean? It means the Messiah. In other words, now the purpose of Saul of Tarsus was to prove that Jesus Christ was what? Was the Messiah. Now, later on, in the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul describes his conversion experience and his change of focus, his change of theology. Notice Philippians chapter 3 and verses 3 through 11. Philippians chapter 3 and verses 3 through 11. Here he says, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. Who is the circumcision? Those who what? Worship God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. In other words, you don't have confidence that you just are, you're literally a Jew. He says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I'm more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. You almost think he's bragging a little bit, don't you? He's saying, I was a Jew of Jews. I was the seed of Abraham, so I thought. But now notice what he continues saying in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these things I have counted, counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which the Jews delighted in according to the New Testament, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may obtain to the resurrection from the dead. What was the change in focus of Saul's theology? Before his theology had been Israel-centered, now his theology was what? Was Christ-centered. He says, everything that I considered important, my Jewishness, I considered a loss in order that I may gain Christ. In other words, Christ is all in all. And when I received Christ, I became the true seed of Abraham. And you know the Bible tells us that the Apostle Paul fell in love with Christ so much that he was willing to suffer intensely for accepting him. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verses 22 through 28 where, where the Apostle Paul describes all of the sufferings that, that came about because of his acceptance and preaching of Christ. He says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? And then he says, I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequently. In death often. From the Jews five times I have received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my, country, my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, nakedness besides the other things, that what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the church. Was Saul truly converted to Jesus Christ? Was his theology now Israel-focused? Absolutely not. 
He said, Jewishness means nothing outside of Jesus. One is not a seed of Abraham simply by his bloodline. One is the seed of Abraham by being in Christ through baptism. Because if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed. Which basically, so the Apostle Paul is saying that the Jews that had not accepted Christ were not the seed of Abraham. We're going to pursue that in a few moments. Now, the Bible tells us that not only Saul of Tarsus, but also all of the New Testament authors clearly tell us that God does not have two peoples, the Jews and the church, and that he has one plan for the Jews and he has another plan for the church. That is an idea that has come up in the last 150 years in the Christian world, that God has one plan for the church, which is going to be taken away to heaven seven years uh, before the tribulation, and uh, they're going to go to heaven, and then the Jews are going to be left behind, they're going to reestablish the sacrifices, and they're going to suffer terrible tribulation. The Bible teaches, and especially the Apostle Paul, that God has only one true people, and that people are defined by their acceptance or rejection of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, we're going to go through a list of things that show that God has only one people. John chapter 10 and verse 16. Here Jesus is speaking, and I want you to notice what he says. John chapter 10 and verse 16. Jesus says here, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. What does he mean, this fold? What, what does he mean by this fold? He means the Jews, because he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We already read that. So he says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be two flocks and one shepherd. Ah, uh -uh. one flock and one what? One shepherd. Now, lest you're wondering whether he's talking about the Gentiles when he says that there are other sheep not of this fold, let's go to John chapter 11, verses 51 and 52. John chapter 11 and verses 51 and 52. After Caiaphas says that it's necessary for one man to die and that the nation doesn't perish, notice what we're told in John 11, verse 51. Now this he did not say on his own authority. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for that nation. Now listen carefully. What nation is that? The Jewish nation. That he would die for the nation. And now notice. And not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Was he only going to gather the Jews to himself? No. He was going to gather the Gentiles to himself as well. In other words, God doesn't have two folds, a Gentile fold and a Jewish fold. He says, I'm going to bring the Gentiles, and there's going to be one fold, and there's going to be one shepherd. The Bible also tells us that there is only one Israel, and that Israel is defined by your relationship to Jesus Christ. If you are Christ, you are Israel. If you are not Christ, you are not Israel, you are not a Jew. And you say, where does the Bible say that? Let's read from the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 2 and verses 28 and 29. Romans 2, 28 and 29. Here the Apostle Paul says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. So is it possible for a Jew to be one outwardly and not be a Jew? Of course. For he is not a Jew who is one out outwardly. Nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one what? Inwardly. And circumcision is that of the what? Of the heart. In the spirit, not in the letter, because the Jews loved the letter, but they didn't have the spirit, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Is it possible to be an outward Jew and not be a Jew? Absolutely, according to the Apostle Paul. Now notice Romans 9, verses 6 through 8. The same idea that there's only one true Israel, and that's defined by your relationship to Jesus Christ. Romans 9 and verses 6 through 8. Here the Apostle Paul says, But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. 
Isn't that interesting? Are all Israelites Israelites? No, the Apostle Paul is saying, not all Israel is Israel. <laughs> now, who is Israel then? Let's continue reading. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. Are all the seed of Abraham the seed of Abraham? No, absolutely not. He says, nor are they all children because of the, they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. And now he explains what he means. That is, those who are children of the flesh. These are not children of God. Who are the children of the flesh? The literal Jews who have not accepted whom? Christ. So he says, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise, that is the promise of the Messiah, are counted as the seed. Are you understanding this? In other words, being Israel or being a Jew is not defined geographically or ethnically or genetically. It's defined by your relationship to Jesus Christ. Notice Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, and then we'll go to verses 26 to 29. We alluded to this, but let's read it once again. It says there in Galatians 3, verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. So who is the only true seed of Abraham? One, Christ. You say, but didn't we just read that we are seed of Abraham? Yes, we are, but not in a primary sense like Christ. Only if we join Christ, then we are Abraham's seed. Notice verse 26. For you are all sons of God, how? Through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on what? Christ. Now notice, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now notice, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So how does one become Abraham's seed? If you are Christ's, you are Abraham's seed. So my question is, those who are outside of Christ, who are literal Jews, are they Abraham's seed according to the biblical definition? Absolutely not. Because we're speaking about a spiritual relationship with Christ that makes you a spiritual Jew so to speak. Now, the Bible also says that Jesus has only one body. He doesn't have two bodies, the body of the Jews and the body of the church. He has one body. Let's read from Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 13 through 18. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 13 through 18. Here the Apostle Paul is writing again. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, those are the Gentiles, have been brought near how? By the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both, that is Jew and Gentile, what? One. And has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself, how many new men? One new man from the two, that is from Jew and Gentile, thus making peace and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. Through him we both, that is Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit to whom? To the Father. How many bodies does Jesus have? One Jewish body and one Gentile body. No, he has one body composed of Jew and Greek, or Jew and Gentile. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. Here the Apostle Paul writes, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into, what? One body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into what? One Spirit. So how many bodies are we talking about? How many spirits? One spirit. Notice Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6. 
Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6. This is a beautiful message to the Gentiles. The Apostle Paul is saying to the Gentiles, if you receive Christ, you are Jews. You are spiritual Jews. You are Israel. Because he who is in Christ is Abraham's seed. Notice what it says in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 6. That the Gentiles should be what? Fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through what? Through the gospel. How many bodies does Jesus have? One. How many folds does Jesus have? One. Now I want you to notice that he only has one city. You know, he doesn't have the earthly Jerusalem for the Jews and the heavenly Jerusalem for the church. That's preposterous. It's not biblical. Notice Revelation chapter 21, verse 2. By the way, the New Jerusalem is called the city of the Lamb, the Lamb city, right? And the Lamb is its light. Now notice Revelation 21, and verse 2. It's speaking here about the New Jerusalem. And it says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her what? Husband. So Jerusalem has, uh, uh, the husband has how many cities? Has only one city. Now, that city is composed of Old Testament saints and New Testament saints. Not only New Testament saints. Notice Revelation 21 and verse 12. Revelation 21 and verse 12. Speaking about the city, it says, Also she had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and twelve angels at the gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the what? Of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Whose names are on the doors of the city or the gates of the city? The twelve tribes. So is the Old Testament represented there, the Old Testament church? Absolutely. Now, what names do the foundations of the walls have? Notice Revelation 21 and verse 14. Revelation 21 and verse 14. It says, Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. How many cities did Jesus have? Only one city, composed of Old Testament saints and composed of New Testament saints. Because the names of the tribes are on the doors or on the gates, and the names of the apostles are on the foundations of the walls. Now go with me to Hebrews chapter 11, and I'll amplify this thought that Jesus has only one city. Notice Hebrews chapter 11, we'll read verses 9 and 10, and then we'll read verses 13 through 16. This is speaking about Abraham in the Old Testament. It says, By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited, now listen, this is Abraham. Was Abraham an Old Testament saint? Was he, uh, was he the founder of the Jewish nation, according to the Jews themselves? Yeah, they said, we are Abraham's seed. Now notice what it continues saying in verse 10. What city did Abraham look forward to? The earthly or the heavenly Jerusalem? The heavenly. Verse 10 says, For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And now let's go to verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. It's talking about the Old Testament saints. But having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a what? If they're strangers and pilgrims, they're seeking a homeland. What is that homeland? It's that little city over in the Middle East today, right? No, absolutely not. Notice verse 15. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they came out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better. That is a what? A heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Did the Old Testament saints look forward to the New Jerusalem? Yes, they did. How about the New Testament saints? Absolutely. Is there one city for all of God's people from all ages? Absolutely. Not two cities. Now let's look at it from a different perspective. How many wives does God have, spiritually speaking? <laughs> he has one. But those who believe that God has two mutually separable peoples would make God a bigamist. Because he has the church, and he's married with the church, but he's also married with Israel. And so he has two wives. The Bible doesn't sustain that. God has one bride, and it's the church of all ages, Old and New Testament. Let's notice that. Revelation chapter 12. 
Revelation chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to jump to verse 5. It says there in verse 1 of Revelation 12, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Now, uh, what does this woman represent? We've already studied this. Represents the Old Testament church, right? Was Jesus born from uh, the line of Abraham and from the line of David? Absolutely, he was born from the Old Testament church. Who is the child? The child is Jesus Christ. Now, when John sees this woman, does he see the woman at the Old Testament stage or the New Testament stage? It's the Old Testament stage because the child hasn't been born yet. Does the mother exist before the child? So is the mother the Old Testament church? Of course. So notice that this woman is going to bear the child. This is the Old Testament church that's going to bring Jesus into the world. But now I want you to notice that the very same woman flees to the wilderness for 1,260 years after the child is caught up to God into his throne. Is it the same woman? So is the Old Testament church and the New Testament church, are they the same woman? They're the same woman at different stages. Are you understanding me? Let's read verse uh, 5 uh, and verse 6. It says, she bore a male child, that is the woman, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. That's the ascension of Christ. And then notice verse 6. Then the woman, is it the same woman? Absolutely, it's the same woman. It says, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Is that the New Testament church or is that the Old Testament church? That's the New Testament church because Jesus has already ascended to God into his throne and now this refers to the period when the church was persecuted during the Middle Ages. Are you understanding? So God has how many brides? How many wives does he have? One wife compared a, a composed of Old Testament and New Testament church represented by one woman only. Now the Bible also says that God uh, has only one tree representing all of his people from Old and New Testament, Jews and Gentiles. You say, now where does the Bible teach that? Have you ever read the story that we find in uh, Romans chapter 11 about the tree, the, the, the tree that had natural branches and then you have wild olive branches that are engrafted into the tree. Now let me tell you what you have there, because we don't have all the time to look at all, all of the details. I'm going to read the passage in a few moments, but I want you to get this clear in your mind. The tree has natural olive branches that are retained on the tree. Okay? The tree represents Jesus Christ. He is, uh, he is the tree and we are the branches. Okay? So the natural branches are retained. Those who are, are the ones who accepted Jesus Christ. Then there are natural branches that are cut off. Why are they cut off? Because they rejected Jesus Christ. You can read it there, and I'm going to read it in a few moments. Then you have natural branches that after they're cut off, they're, they're, they're grafted in again. What would that represent? It represents the fact that at first they rejected Christ, like whom? Like Saul of Tarsus, and then he accepted Christ, and he's what? And he's regrafted into the olive tree. Then you have wild olive branches, which represents the Gentiles, and the wild olive branches are grafted into the tree. But then the Apostle Paul says that if the wild olive branches come to reject Christ, the wild olive branches will be cut off from the tree. Now what is the key in this whole passage? The key is who you are attached to. What makes you part of the tree? Your acceptance or rejection of whom? Your acceptance or rejection of Jesus Christ. Now let's read the passage. It's found in Romans chapter 11, and it's a rather lengthy passage, but let's read it. It's verse 17 through verse 26. Here the Apostle Paul says, And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree, speaking to the Gentiles here, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. In other words, don't make fun of the natural branches that were cut off. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well said. Now notice why these branches were broken off. Because of unbelief they were broken off. Unbelief in whom? 
in Jesus, and you stand by faith. Why were the wild olive branches uh, grafted in? Because they had faith in Christ. Why were the natural olive branches cut off? Because of unbelief in Christ. And then he says, do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fail severity, but towards you goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise you also will be cut off. Are you catching the picture? And they also, if they do not continue in what? In unbelief will be grafted in. What's the key here? It's Jesus Christ, isn't it? You're part of the tree if you've accepted Christ. You're cut off from the tree if you don't accept Christ. But both Jews and Gentiles are grafted into one tree. Verse 24, for if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. And then he explains that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So there's blindness among Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Now what happens when the fullness of the Gentiles come in and join with the Jews in one body? Notice what we find in verse 26. And so all Israel will be saved. What does it mean, all Israel will be saved? What is Israel composed of, according to the context? It's composed of Israel plus what? Plus the Gentiles that are grafted into the tree. In other words, when Jews and Gentiles are grafted into the tree, then all Israel will be what? Saved. Now the question is, what is Israel? Does the Apostle Paul define what Israel is? Of course he does. It's not literal Israel over in the Middle East. It is spiritual Israel. Now, we find in the Bible that there is also going to be only one bank banquet table in the kingdom. God's not going to have one banquet table for the Jews and another banquet table for the Gentiles. Right after healing the son of a centurion, Jesus spoke these words in Matthew chapter 8 and verses 11 and 12. By the way, the centurion was a Gentile, wasn't he? So now Jesus is going to give the lesson. He's going to say this centurion had more faith than Israel. And now notice what he says. Verse 11, I say to you that many will come from east and west, those are the Gentiles, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob literal Jews? Yes. Were they also spiritual Jews? They, they, they were because they accepted Christ in promise. And so it says, and I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now listen carefully. But the sons of the kingdom, who are those? The literal Jewish nation that rejects Christ. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer what? Darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. How many people are going to eat at the banquet table? Only Jews are going to eat at the banquet table. No, Jews along with what? With Gentiles. What about those who reject Christ? They will not eat at the table. So once again, what is the key? Is the key to be a literal Jew or not be a literal Jew? No, the key of this whole thing is your relationship to whom? To Jesus Christ. Now the Apostle Paul also said there is only one spiritual temple. You know, the temple in Jerusalem has absolutely no significance today. It could be rebuilt but it has no prophetic significance whatsoever. Some people say, well, doesn't the Bible say that the Antichrist is going to sit in the temple of God showing himself to be God? Yes, the Bible does say that, but we need to understand which temple the Apostle Paul is talking about. Most theologians take, take it for granted that he's talking about that temple over in the Middle East. But how does the Apostle Paul define the temple where the Antichrist is going to sit? That's the key. Allow Paul to interpret Paul. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Ephesians chapter 2, 19 through 22. And by the way, our next lecture is about the Antichrist who sits in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. This lecture today is preparatory to that one. We wouldn't be able to fully understand that lecture without this background that we're studying today. 
Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Now therefore, the Apostle Paul says, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. He's speaking to the Gentiles. But fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Are they members of the same household? Absolutely. And now notice, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The apostles would be New Testament and the prophets would be what? Old Testament. Jesus Christ himself being the chief what? Cornerstone, the one that holds it all together. So are these literal stone foundations or are these people foundations? These are spiritual foundations. Is the cornerstone a literal stone or is it a person? It's a person. It's a, this is a spiritual temple with spiritual foundations and a spiritual cornerstone. Verse 21, in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a what? Oh, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being what? Built together. We are the stones. First Peter chapter 2 says we are the stones that are being built up on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Let me ask you, what is the Shekinah today that is in that temple? Let's finish reading the text. Verse 22. In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of whom? Of God in the Spirit. Does the church have the Shekinah today? Does it have God's Shekinah glory? Yes, what is the Shekinah glory? It is the Holy Spirit. We can't see him, but he is present in the church. Are you with me? So for the Apostle Paul, what is the temple? Is the temple the little, literal building over in the Middle East that's going to be rebuilt and there's going to be a third temple? Absolutely not. For the Apostle Paul, the temple is what? Is the church built upon the, found, the writings of the prophets and of the apostles, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. So when the Bible says that the Antichrist is going to sit in the temple of God showing himself to be God, where should we look for the Antichrist? We should look, look for him sitting where? In the Christian church. Not in the literal temple in Jerusalem. Are you with me? Now, the Bible also tells us that all of the redeemed will sing the same song. Literal and spiritual Israel. Notice what we find in Revelation chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. Revelation chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. Old Testament and New Testament saints are going to sing the same song. Notice, it's speaking here about the 144,000. It says, they sing the song of whom? Of Moses, that's Old Testament, the servant of God. And the song of whom? of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. So how many songs are going to be sung by the redeemed? There's going to be a New Testament song, and there's going to be an Old Testament song. No, it's one song. The song of Moses... He was an Old Testament figure, and the song of whom? The song of the Lamb. That's a New Testament figure. In other words, all of the redeemed will sing one song. The Bible also says that all of us will have only one Father. Notice Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26. Galatians 3 verse 26. What defines whether we are sons of God or not? Listen carefully to what the Bible says. It's not me, it's the Bible. It says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. How do we become sons of God? Through faith in Christ Jesus. What if we don't have faith in Christ Jesus? Then we are not sons of God. I know that's a harsh statement, but that's biblical. Notice John chapter 1, 12 and 13, where this idea is pursued. John 1, verses 12 and 13. It says there, but as many as received him, that is Jesus, to them he gave the right to become what? Children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were not born, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of whom? God. So what makes you a child of God? Your physical birth or your spiritual birth? Your spiritual birth and the fact that you received Christ, because it says as many as received him, to them he gave the right to
to become the children of God. Now listen to the way this works. The only true Son of God is Jesus Christ. Because he's the only faithful one. The Bible says that we are children of wrath. Jesus even went, went one step further. He says, you are your father the devil. Because we're born alienated from God. But we're conceived in sin, according to Scripture. And we have to be converted. We have to accept Christ, and then we're grafted into the family of God. Now, the only one who deserves to be called the Son of God is Jesus Christ. But when I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior, I become his brother. Or in the case of the women here, you become his sister. And so Jesus now comes to the Father and says, Father, I've got a new brother. And the Father says, you do? What's his name? <laughs> Pastor Stephen Barr. The Father says, well, if he's your brother, he's my son too. That's what Jesus meant when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So if you're a literal Jew, but you've rejected Jesus Christ, the biblical definition is that you're not a child of God. We're children of God by creation, but not by redemption. Now let's go to John chapter 8, verses 32 to 44. Here Jesus is having a conversation with the literal Jews. And this is very significant. It says here, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants. Really, it's Abraham's seed. It's the same identical word seed as in Galatians chapter 3. So they say, We are Abraham's seed. And have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And then Jesus says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. He's speaking physically now. You're going to see that. I know that you're literally Abraham's descendants, is what he's saying. But you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father. You do what you have seen with your father. We're not talking about Abraham here, folks. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. And he was their father physically speaking, but he wasn't really their father. Notice what he continues saying. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if Abraham, if you were Abraham's children, which means that they're not. You would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You say you're Abraham's children, but you want to kill me. He would have embraced me. Now notice what it continues saying. Verse 41. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Verse 42. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, which he's saying he isn't, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came, came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. And then notice what he says. These are solemn words. You are of your father the devil. Who wanted Jesus dead? The devil. Did the Jewish nation want him dead too? Except for a few exceptions? Yes. So whose children were they? Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. If you were Abraham's children, you would be rejoicing, is what he's saying. But you want to kill me, just like your father. So he says in verse uh, 44, you are of your father the devil, and the deeds of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. We've also noticed that Jesus has only one breastplate with 12 stones. And those 12 stones represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of the, of the Lamb from which the Old and the New Testament church come. There's only one high priest with 12 stones. There is no such thing like separating literal Israel from, from the church. God has only one people, and it's defined by their relationship to Jesus Christ. You know what the tragic thing is, as we near a close? Is that most preachers today believe just the way Saul of Tarsus did before his conversion. They jump from the Old Testament to the end time and bypass Jesus Christ. They say that God has elected li literal Israel 
unconditionally and irrevocably, no matter whether they receive Jesus or not. And they believe that prophecy will be fulfilled with literal Israel, in literal Jerusalem, in a literal temple, with reestablished literal sacrifices, with a literal personal antichrist sitting in the literal temple for a literal three and a half years, and literal enemies will come from the literal north and the literal south with literal weapons and wage a literal war against literal Jerusalem. When scripture tells us that the war will be against the body of Jesus Christ, it will be against the church, whether they be literal Jews or Gentiles, all joined in one body. Are you understanding this? What has happened today is false prophecy is being preached from almost every single pulpit in the Christian world. They're telling people, look to the Middle East for the fulfillment of prophecy. They're going to rebuild the temple. The Russians and the Arabs are coming against Jerusalem. There's going to be a nasty Antichrist who will sit in the temple. And he's going to rule there for three and a half years, but of course the church will be gone. It will be raptured to heaven. The church isn't going through the tribulation. And meanwhile, the little horn and the beast function in Rome. And the false prophet, as we will study, works in the United States and nobody can see it because they're looking in the wrong place. Is this a serious matter? Listen, folks. The solution to the Jewish-Palestinian problem is very simple. If the Jews accepted Christ as Savior and the Palestinians accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, the conflict in the Middle East would end instantly because they would say, what are we fighting about? We're all brothers because we're all in Christ. Are you understanding what we're studying? Vitally important for what we're going to study in the future.